got it. That turkey hat on for for Thanksgiving here. Come on. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. When is Thanksgiving? Your wonderful colonial. Yeah, well, I'm in New England, where the uh, I'm I'm pretty close actually to Plymouth Rock. So uh, we give thanks to. Uh, I don't really know the, the yeah the genocide. Uh, right, right. We're the, giving uh, thanks to the genocide. Yeah, it's a very nice holiday. So, so we eat turkey. I mean, it, it, it kind of works. If you're giving thanks to genocide, you can as well be the turkey. I just like or that's true. Put yourself into the turkey. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm almost the stuffing, I guess. That's that's good. Yeah, we well, should it, all consider ourselves the stuffing. I mean, yeah. I think it's a very interesting philosophy. Do you see yourself as stuffing of something? You know. Mm-hmm. Stuffing of God, stuffing of the universe, stuffing of art. I don't know. We all stuffing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when I was a little kid, I used to say that as a joke. What do you call people who live in Turkey? Like the country, but I would say stuffing. It was very funny when I was like four. <laughs> I mean, I will tell this to my Turkish friends. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they will laugh about it. Uh, Anyhow, yeah. Uh. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, by the way, everyone, I'm going to keep all that in because I think that's gold. Is uh, welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neil, and I'm joined by Johannes Grinsfurtner. I'm doing the jazz hands. I like it. And the jazz tongue. The jazz tongue. That's going to yeah. sound perverted in a way, but I kind of like it. Yeah. It, it, it. It, it, it kind of is. But I'm from Austria. We can say this. Oh, well, that's not. Real- I'm is not from the Puritan country as you are. Right. So, is this, Although is that I am in the Puritan country, I have to say, because n- right now I'm in North Carolina for Cooper oh, Lawrence yeah, Film Festival. So that's why all this like strange stuff, that's not my living room. So it's, uh, there's kind of- That's a like, hotel? It's not a hotel. It is the Cucoloros compound. So they put me into one of their little huts. They usually rent that out as Airbnbs, I guess, or something like that. So it's just like if you go out this way, like this way, yes. If you go out this way, I'm like you're in some kind of Django's or Playhouse. Right. Yeah. So there's Django's Playhouse. And uh, so in a couple of hours, Cucoloros 2022 will start. And I'm still completely jet lagged. I have no idea. I think I'll need a lot of alcohol to go through the jet lag. And I like that this is just your built-in excuse from Austria, and people are just like, "Oh, okay, well that makes sense." And you know yeah. that he's yeah. dressed this it way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Austrians are known for music and mass murder. I'm not really good in music, and I hardly do mass murder. So we'll see. Yeah, we well, you're still young. You have time. Yeah. Yeah. So what's going on at the North Carolina at this uh, horror fest? Oh, well, it's not a horror fest. It's oh. an indie film festival. Okay, okay. It's not okay. even an It's like it's an art festival, an indie film festival. It's all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, the one person who introduced me to Cucoloris is Aaron Hillis, who is, in the meantime, one of the heads of acquisition at Cinedime uh, and dealing a lot with the bloody disgusting guys. Yeah. And I think he was also behind the whole thing behind Terrifier 2 and stuff. I have no idea. I have not seen him in a couple of months. The last time he was very drunk and I couldn't drink because I was driving. Mm. So this time we'll both get drunk. And yeah, so anyhow, so a couple of years ago, he introduced me to Cucoloris Film Festival, which is this really great indie film festival in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, I have been to North Carolina before, but in the last year or two, I spent more time probably than necessary in North Carolina <laughs> because my connections here to Cucoloris Film Festival. And it's really great. And my, my new film, Rat's Nest, will have its um, screening on Friday here. At Cucoloris. Mm-hmm. And I'm even more excited about that. On Saturday, there will be a live performance by uh, Madame Rossellini, who most people probably know from uh, her performance in Blue Velvet. Oh, Isabella nice. Rossellini. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, she'll have a live performance here, and I will see it. So I'm very happy about that. <laughs> Well, I actually had in my notes because your movies don't fit into any genre, any one genre. They probably blend into different genres. So when you do like uh, submit them to different festivals, like what 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 ones you look for? Because you play horror festivals, you're playing at this one that's an indie, indie festival. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's indie, and they're also playing art house films here, which makes a lot of sense because my new film 
is at the same time a horror film and also a pretentious art house film. Yeah, and uh, making fun of, of pretentious art house films. Yeah, and also making fun about genre films. So it's kind of like it's it, it, it's a it's a mixed bag, a, a positive mixed bag. And I think they liked it. I think I think they 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 really dug the idea that uh, you kind of like mix those genres together, or kind of like. Uh, uh, but what what can I say? So I'm from Austria, and uh, most of the films that people know that come from Austria are art house films. You know, like Michael Haneke or like Ulrich Seidel and and, and stuff like that. And uh, so I have like a. a a, a, a strange relationship with Austrian art house films. So, and my 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 new film Ratsnest is also dealing with that uh, because I don't want to spoil too much, but it's a it's a film that is at the same time a film and not a film. <laughs> so it's a film and also an audio play, but at the same time. So it's uh, well, I mean, I can say so far because most people will get it in, within the first minute, anyways. It's uh, it's. On the visual layer, it's uh, a pretty dubious, let's call it, art house film uh, that doesn't feature any people, only buildings and strange forests and, and crosses and Christian iconography. And uh, on the audio layer, it's, uh, of course, the soundtrack of that film by Alec Empire, who is a friend of mine, uh, who is... Uh, mostly known for doing Atari Teenage Riot, uh, started that in the 1990s. And uh, so the audio layer of the film is the audio commentary about the art house film. Mm -hmm. So the pretentious art house director and a Rotten Tomatoes approved critic and the DUP slash camera operator of the film and the uh, producer of the film, they talk about the art house film. And at some point you realize, oh, there is something going wrong. So in a certain way, uh, the actual plot of the film is only in the audio commentary track of the film. Right. You're kind of like watching a different film and listening to the audio commentary track about that film and all the stuff that's actually going on. So the, the, the horror film elements that probably are most interesting for you and your podcast you never see them you just hear them or you get interesting correlations between what you're hearing in the audio commentary track and uh, what you're seeing in the art house film uh layer yeah yeah that's it, what you said uh, audio play that that's what i actually wrote in my notes it's uh very so which do you write this whole when you're like putting this together do you write the script out or do you film everything first well, in that case, I'm I'm so sorry. My my ectoplasm detector set. That's is all really, right. Yeah. We gotta uh, keep you safe like, in really, North Carolina. Making, it's giving me problems. I mean, that was one of the. I like fuck that shit. Whatever. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I mean, there's strange residue in my bathroom. So, and I believe it's from ghosts or something like that. Right, that's yeah. why. That's why I was. You don't want to ask too that. many questions at the Airbnb. Nah, yeah, it's it, it, it's okay. And also, I was like, I mean. They gave me this room for free, and I don't want to complain about it. Yeah, but it's the, it's the bone. Nobody is taking care of the the ghost residue in the mm. in the bathroom. So, like, I have to do that myself. I had I to know. go to Walmart to get it. So, yeah. anyhow. So, anyhow, <laughs> okay. So, your question was: It's an audio play. It's an audio so play, and so, uh, so the the visual stuff was. It, did you go and film or have that film beforehand, or did, did you write out what the, all the dialogue and the audio first? Uh, how did okay. that come about? Okay, so the whole thing started with an idea, and I never have ideas uh, in the shower, but this film actually came out of an idea that I had in the shower, and it was pretty quick. Like on the, I had the idea for the film on the thirty first of January of this year. And the entire film was done in um, mid of June, 2022. So I could submit it to the film festivals. And I was also very happy that Fantastic uh, Fest had it, it had the world premiere at Fantastic Fest in, in September. So it was a pretty fast production. And that only worked because I could separate the, the audio and kind of like plot track from the visual track. So in this case, I sat down and pretty much like wrote 
the audio commentary. So I wrote the plot mm -hmm. and then had a look at it and already kind of like knew, okay, I need a certain kind of footage for that. <laughs> And uh, also without not spoiling, but the further you go into the film, the more correlations start between the audio level and the, and the video level. So what I did is like I wrote the script uh, and that happened like probably like two weeks or something like that. I needed some feedback because there are big parts of the film that are in 1600s German. So it's like very old school German. And I needed experts to help me with, with writing that down. So I kind of like wrote it down in German, German of 2022. And right. then I had lots of conversations with, with experts in ancient German and, and adopted, adapted that. But then all in all, it was like a process of like two or three weeks of writing that. And then I knew I could get my, my, my DOPs. Uh, so Florian and Feline and Ronald for probably three or four days. So there was a super like minimal time slot. So I knew I would have to get all the visual material I need in three to four days. And so we went uh, into the Austrian countryside because the documentary film deals with a very specific area in Austria called the Ruhrwald. And, uh, and we shot all the footage there. And there was like seven terabytes of footage or something like that. And the film pretty much kind of like happened in editing, of course. So because I had the script, I knew what images I needed. Then I kind of realized while shooting the footage, ah, certain things are actually pretty cool. And I've even thought about that or certain things I couldn't find. So I had a couple of things in the script that I wanted to film. But I couldn't track it down. I couldn't find the locations of those uh, of those things. So I had to kind of like adjust the, the script a little bit. But all in all, I would say like 90% of what I wrote in the script remained what it was. And even after the shooting, and then uh, uh, and then I had like seven terabytes of footage. And then I was sitting there like a monk for like a Carthusian monk for like three months or something mm -hmm. like that and editing all of that stuff. And uh, I didn't really edit it in a way that, you know, like I didn't just like put the audio track into Resolve and just like filled it up with uh, visual footage. So I kind of like some parts of the film, I kind of edited the film without the audio track because, I mean, the film is is pretty much the audio track about an existing mm -hmm. right. fictitious film. Right. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of like make the film as as an entity that could work without the audio commentary track. So the first like month or so was just working on just like trying to create this pretentious art house film and kind of like putting myself into the mindset of that pretentious director that creates that art house film. So I was working on that for a long time. And then I put the audio commentary track on top of that. And I kind of realized, oh, there are already correlations that I wasn't even planning to do, but that worked pretty well. So that was an interesting, uh, also like on the on the production side, an interesting way of dealing with this. And uh, I hadn't done that before. I guess nobody has really done something like that. It's a very unique so, movie yeah. Yeah. In, in many ways, yeah. I remember, yeah, like you saw it first at Nightmares in, in uh, Columbus. Yeah, I wasn't Ohio. even sure. what I like. I, I got the gist, but I was like, I'm not sure what's happening here. So, uh, But it was good to, to rewatch it. Plus, uh, when you're at a festival, especially like two in a row, you get kind of delirious watching movies for like. Yeah, uh, yeah. For like and I have to say, I mean, I think the film also kind of like uh, it. I wouldn't say it needs a lot of attention. I think if you if you get well, the yeah, idea, yeah, and yeah. if you like the idea, and if you kind of like find the flow with the film, I think mm -hmm. it's 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 that that that's all it needs, I guess. But of course, some people, I mean, I, I totally understand that this is a film that some people will not be able to deal with because sure. it's just like too weird for them. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Which is, um, you know, not everything is for everybody. No, I'm sure you have to I realize mean, when you're making that. Um, interesting though, when I watch masking a uh, threshold, the, they are similar. Um, are, were they similar to make because masking threshold is also a lot of almost like an audio play in a way. Yeah. Set to visual. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They, they, they share, 
cultural DNA, let's call it, in a certain way. And they definitely share, I mean, they, they're, they're kind of like, uh, like siblings from a very different mother, let's, let's call it that way. Uh, and so Masking Threshold is, uh, is a film of, about a guy. It, Masking Threshold is way more straightforward than, mm-hmm. than Rot's Nest. Rot's Nest is very meta. It's a, it's a commentary about films and the film scene and festivals. And it's also a commentary about filmmaking itself. But then it's a commentary about, about spectacle and, 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 and war and the spectacle of war. So it, it has more layers than uh, uh, than masking threshold, and also it is a comedy, at least to a certain degree. It is right. a very dark black. Yeah, comedy. masking threshold is a very, yeah. a very masking comedy. threshold is a different animal. Masking threshold is very straightforward horror drama, and it is a monologue. So for all the people who don't know it, it's about a guy going insane, and he locks himself in his little makeshift laboratory in the, in Central Florida, and he's trying to find out why he has a ringing in his ears. Like for the last three years, even before the film starts, he's dealing with this like tinnitus kind of like hearing impairment. Mm-hmm. And he just like says like, I'm done with that. Nobody can help me. All the doctors are idiots. Uh, I spend all my money on 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 stupid doctors. and But I'm a nerd. I know how things work. I'm a very positivistic, uh, you know, like skeptical person. I can find out what what's the problem with my brain and the problem with my hearing, and I'll figure it out. And then he starts going on this journey, and the journey is only in that room. So he is in his room and starting experiments and finds out that he, if he touches certain objects, the tinnitus changes. And so he tries to find out what's going on. And of course, uh, it doesn't end well. <laughs> so it's uh, And it's compared to Rot's Nest, very straightforward, I think. It has a very experimental way of presenting it because yeah. 70% of the film are uh, like enlargements, are macro shots, because I wanted to convey the story of the guy going insane in a way of like that he is like, he can't see the world anymore. He is just like, he's so focusing on his desk and the experiments that he's doing on his desk. It's almost like he's falling into the, the endless of his desk. And, and, and I wanted to, to show that with the enlargements. And I mean, if you look at pizza, I mean, everything that you look at in enlargement looks nasty and weird and crazy. Like even uh-huh. pizza, whatever it is. Yeah. Pizza. Ants, whatever it is, it, it, it's it's all disgusting and, and 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 strange and a different world. And and for me, I thought that might be a good idea of visualizing this journey for him that that he's 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 not able to communicate anymore with the world. That he's kind of like blocking it all out and and disappearing in his desk. And uh, that doesn't end well for him and his neighbor and a couple of other people. Yeah. But and I was wondering because I know you do a lot of uh, documentaries, and I was wondering if the documentary work um, influences your your, uh, your these films. Not not necessarily like uh, you're making a documentary, but just the way you actually put them together. Because in a documentary, if you don't have talking heads, um, then you have to do other visuals. You know, when when you yeah. have the audio over, and that's sort of how these movies feel like they're made. Yeah, yeah. So with Masking Threshold. I pretty much had the whole film like in my in my head already. So I, I, I knew it would be like a 90 minute monologue, pretty much almost like an H.P. Lovecraft short story. And it, it has Lovecraftian yeah. vibes, at least in, in the end, yeah, most like definitely. Stuff, yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. And so I kind of knew I need images. So it wasn't so much that I needed images to fill up the monologue. It was actually the other way around. I knew that I, I had the idea of like the guy going insane and I knew that I would want to show this with macro shots. So most of the images I already had in my mind before I even started writing uh, the the monologue. Mm-hmm. So it was, I, I had this like visual landscape of how the film should look like. And and based on that, I wrote the script together with Samantha. <laughs> and, uh, and, then in, and then it was kind of like almost like a dialogue while filming, we realized some things wouldn't work, or some things are so disgusting or great that they need to they need more space in the film. So of course, I I try to adjust that. But 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 I mean, you're right. I mean, uh, both films, like 
Rat's Nest is actually like a document documentary film, a fictitious one with an audio sure. commentary on track. And also Masking Threshold is the documentation of this guy's experiments as he goes insane and, and goes crazy. So they have documentarian aspects about it, but, uh, and they are both to a certain degree, at least found footage films. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I wouldn't say I did those films because I like documentaries or because I did documentaries before. Mm -hmm. Just for example, there's, I did my, my first feature length documentary was called Trace Route. Uh, and it's pretty much a documentary about nerd culture mm -hmm. because I'm a very nerdy person. It is, let's call it, it, it's a very autobiographical film about myself and, and my nerddom and the time that I grew up being a nerd when there wasn't even a term for that in Austria. Yeah. In well, it, yeah. even myself, like in the eighties, uh, you know, I was, I play, I was in chess club and I played dungeons and dragons and like, you know, uh, horror, uh, obscure horror movies like basket case and stuff. But today, all that stuff's like cool. It's cool yeah. to be a nerd, but it wasn't yeah, it, cool it, to be a nerd, you know. Exactly. That cool. that's because nerds are running the world now. I mean, fucking Elon Musk is a nerd, you know. Like, right. and and I mean, the best example. I think that's also what I wanted to deal with in 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 uh, in Trace Route, my nerd documentary is is dealing with what are nerds nowadays. Uh, so, because if you think of nerds nowadays, you also think about incels and you think about Gamergate or you think about, you know, like 4chan or something like that. And it's all kind of like horrible things, you know, mm -hmm. and I wanted to kind of like find out what is the, what is the core element of being a nerd? What is this like, what's the positive element of obsessiveness and of like, like digging into something and wanting to know something and, 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 and trying to explore all there is to know about <laughs> Like I, think I don't know, like term, bird eggs or like uh, Bulgarian computer viruses from 1989, or or right. or uh, Marvel books or something like that. It doesn't matter. Yeah, like so. What, what, there is an obsessiveness, and and I think there is a positive element to that. Mm -hmm. And some people forget that, or or completely like drop into the negativity of just like of bullying. Let's call it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the even the term nerd isn't doesn't have a real negative uh feel to it so much anymore that's why like you have to have the subcultures of the nerds like the incels yeah. and the fortune because that's like a negative feeling where i think just nerd is kind of almost like you know it's it's not a it's not a super negative word like it used to be no no it, it, it was a, like appropriation of hate speech you know like right. people called us nerds and we yeah kind of like took it as a badge and it's like, yeah, sure. I'm a nerd. Yeah. Uh, that, 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 that's what I am. Uh, and, uh, and pretty much like all the things that I did in my life. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not only doing films, I'm doing all kinds of crazy things. I'm, I'm running a festival for cocktail robotics. I mean, like, like how nerdy is that? <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, so, so th th there are other elements to it, but I mean, if, uh, for example, if I take, a project like Trace Route. Trace Route was my way of trying to paint an interesting, positive uh, perspective for nerds. So, what is the subversive, interesting, great kind of like commonality that all nerds have, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and and see that as kind of like a superpower. So, what is the superpower of being a nerd? Uh, and, 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 and what, what good can we do with that? And, uh, masking threshold was kind of like my own answer to that. So what if a nerd like me would go insane? How would a nerd go insane? What, what, what are the kind of like the, the, to, to be super philosophical about it, what, what would be the ontological or, or, or epistemological ways that a nerd goes insane? And, uh, and I, I like that a lot because honestly, if like that, at least that's how I wrote it up until a certain point in Masking Threshold, I would not disagree with the main character. I mean, the main character is a douchebag and an asshole from the very beginning in the film. But of course, it gets gradually more and more extreme. And at some point, you can't find, you, you cannot have sympathy for that guy anymore because he's just like an asshole and, and he's right. killing animals and people and stuff like that but but most of the things he says are at least for me right i mean his uh, i think his, that's the best that's always the best villain 
Exactly. Yeah. So, like, you, 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 you find at least if you're an intelligent person, a commonality with that character, and you actually agree with him on certain things. He, you can agree with him on his perspective on evolution or his perspective on religion or whatever it is. Uh, but at some point, and I think that's what I tried with the film is like when, when, when what he says that you can technically agree with kind of like goes so far beyond what he does. So like his actions are suddenly not kind of like a mirroring or a resemblance of that, what he's talking about anymore. So at some point you realize he's not interested in the world anymore and saving it and, and, and doing something that is not only be beneficial for him, but also for, for humanity in general, you don't believe that anymore. You just, you just see like the guy's crazy. He's insane. He's just like, you don't do that. <laughs> this is like, get help. Uh, and I know it's kind of hard to get decent health care in the United States, yeah, but yeah. I mean, that's also like part of the film. It's like in the United States, if, if I would have written that plot in Austria, it would have to be different because in Austria, there are more ways of getting help. There, there are more social nets within society and, and health care and, and also mental health care is way more affordable or free. Uh, so, so it makes a lot of sense that the guy is a Florida man and gets completely insane in Florida because, uh, right. because of his surroundings and, you know, like the way how, how he cannot actually get the help he needs. Yeah. That's yeah. what people like people always say about the show Breaking Bad. If it took place in Europe, it, it would just the, you know, he gets, he has cancer and then, you know, he gets help and that'll be the end of the show instead of him have to become a, a drug dealer to pay for his, uh, absolutely. His cancer treatment. Al al although, uh, kind of like, uh, the, 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 the big guys, they're all Europeans. You remember? I, it, it's like the, the, like, like one of the competing drug cartels. Isn't that from Germany? Uh, as far as oh, I remember, yeah, I think he is eventually. Yeah. 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 Because there's just like Germans are just efficient in in anything they're doing, like even drug stuff, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> but but you're absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, a person like 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 Walter White would get healthcare. He would get kind of like free uh, chemotherapy and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Hmm. So, uh, Raza Nest. Um, you said yourself it's not for everybody. So how, so when you started to send it out to uh, to festivals, like what kind of reaction did you get? Well, with both films, Masking Threshold and Rod's Nest, I was so happy when I first saw them, uh, like on a big screen, you know, when, when the audio uh, mastering is done and everything is done, then you, you first watch it, usually with your sound guy. Uh, uh, in uh, on a big screen to to hear like the the surround sound and everything and in both cases, uh, I saw the film. I watched it. I was so happy with it because it was in both cases like exactly what I wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. And you're so happy with the film, and at the same time you think, who the fuck <laughs> would actually want to watch this? <laughs> who? Who? And with Masking Threshold, I was even more worried than with Rod's Nest because I was thinking, fuck, it is too arty for like the, the general, you know, like horror crowd possibly. And it's also too genre and too horror for like the, the art house film crowd. I so I thought like that. everyone would hate it. Everyone, nobody would really like this. Uh -huh. It would be just like between, in German we say, zwischen den Stühlen. It would be between the chairs for everyone, you know? <laughs> uh, and, uh, well, and then, I mean, and then Fantastic Fest happened and, and they picked it up and it had world premiere at Fantastic Fest. And from then on, I mean, I still hold a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes oh, really? for, for Masking Threshold. I mean, it's not that, I think it's like 13 or something, 13 reviews. I mean, it's like not a hundred reviews and at some point it, it will drop, of course. But I'm still super excited how, how people embraced it mm -hmm. and i guess uh because first i always thought that horror film fans are kind of conservative in a way because if even if you like if you go on, on on imdb or if you go on letterboxd and you see the reviews of of horror films even like classics like absolute classics like you know like the thing or something like that even those films do not like have have not 
the same level of positive uh, like ratings. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, films of un other genres, like science fiction films or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I always had the feeling of like horror film nerds are extremely kind of like they, they, they are looking for a specific kind of thing. And if they don't get it, they don't like it. <laughs> that was my my stereotypical like yeah. perspective on, on on horror nerd culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It can be something new, but it can't be too new. If mm -hmm. it's too new, nah, I don't like it. I don't like yeah. it. Yeah. I want kind of like a I want the repetition of something that's already there, made in a great way. And maybe a little bit more blood and maybe a little bit whatever it is, you know? Yeah. Uh and and so that was my perspective. I walked into the whole thing that, oh, my God, they will hate it. And and the other thing happened that most of the people like it because it is so different that many people say, like, I've never seen something like that before. So it is it might be super strange, but there's something appealing about the way you made it. And and that, of course, makes me very happy. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I've seen lots of movies uh, since I was a kid and doing the show, and both of them are very unique. And th that doesn't happen very often. And for me, I'd rather watch something that's you the, the worst kind of movie, even if it's technically well made. But if it's something I've seen a million times and you could tell, like, there's no real passion involved. That's kind of like the word, like a, a haunted house movie. That's basically the same kind of movie I've seen a thousand times. That's yeah. to me, the most boring thing I can watch. Yeah. And for me, like horror films are like, I, I, I watched horror films my whole life. I mean, I think, uh, I watched Poltergeist when I was like eight or something like that. And I think it was still, I was still the most, maybe that's a very privileged thing being able to say, but I think I never was as scared in my life ever again as when I watched Poltergeist when I was eight years old or right. something like that. I, I almost shed myself. <laughs> I, 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 I can't believe how the strange things that went on in my body when I watched this. I could not believe what I was seeing. I always, when I was a kid, uh, when he's, when his face is coming off in, in the, uh, in the, uh, when he's washing and the, that always scared me. And even little things like the, um, like the pup, the, it was like a clown pup or something in a room. Cause I always had a lot of, uh, Oh yeah. 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 The, yeah, yeah. That always and, gets to me. And the tree, the yeah. tree and everything. And, Ah, uh, yeah. Now, and anyhow, it's it's a great movie. It's still yeah. it's 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 one of my 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 old all time favorites, and so 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 I, I like horror films. Uh, and so if if you look back in 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 film history, horror films were always the avant garde of trying out new things. I mean, you can go back to I don't know, like Nosferatu in the nineteen twenties, oh, yeah. and you have this like wonderful aesthetics of like uh, it's like. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, like all that the set design and everything is so ex expression, uh, expression. Yeah, uh, German expressionism. But yeah. Expressionism, yes, exactly. And uh, and and and, and, uh, and, and Caligari, that can, yeah, all those movies yeah, of that era. Everything, and then and then you just like go forward in the years, and you will see that there is some form of visual technique, some form of storytelling, something was tested out in in a horror film and and then became mainstream like something like i don't like i'm not even sure you could call it a horror film but like something like seven i mean i would uh, say it, but yeah yeah so like so, okay let's say seven is a horror film and just like just like the opening credits of seven this like experimental style you know like that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and then also the way like uh this like the now i mean there are so many examples for that 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 horror films try something out and then uh, other forms of uh, of films use similar techniques then to do that. So horror film was always very experimental and aesthetically innovative. Let's call it that way. And uh, on the plot level, uh, most of the time it was kind of like the same, the same, the same, the same, the same. So it is a strange genre of like trying to to do new things, but at the same time there is also this internal force of like let, let's tell the same story again and again and again yeah. and let, let, well, let, let's see how it evolves. silly examples like uh jason x so like they have this really crazy idea what if jason's frozen and he's you know then he gets thought out way in the future which is actually kind of a neat idea 
But then the movie they make really is a typical Friday Thirteenth movie, only it just happens to be in a spaceship, where he's just he's just tracking down, killing the uh, the young uh, the people on the yeah. on the spaceship. Now, of course, that's especially true in in franchises where people are going into the film expecting something. I mean, you 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 saw the whole debate about the last Halloween film, yeah, yeah. where they actually really try to do something different, uh -huh. and of course, uh, like for many many people, that completely backfired. Well, this <laughs> yeah. film is not this film is not about Michael Myers anymore. It's about this other guy. And like, well, why? Where? Who is the other well, guy? I think the problem for me <laughs> was like they did try something new, but then about halfway through the movie, they just gave up on that. Yeah, it, yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah. It, it was. It didn't follow through in what they were doing to me. It's like yeah, I, yeah. I'd be all for if they just made a movie about that character, but it's like they kill off this new guy that they they create already in his own movie, and then just go back to uh, the Michael Myers storyline from the, the previous one. Yeah, so it's a weird. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was. Yeah, anyhow, but but you see, you see how 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 conflicted the yeah. filmmakers but are, like, and how I love the audience three. is about. I love Halloween three, which a lot of people do now, but th at the time it wasn't a favorite, but yeah, that was completely different. Than I mean, the the problem is if you establish that, that the ongoing Michael Myers element yeah. in Halloween, like in the second one, of course, in the third one, people are expecting that. I think if they would have done uh, the third one as the second one and just like keep going as this like anthology series yeah. like, of having like a different Halloweenish right. story with different monsters or something like that every year. I think that could also have worked. I would say totally. Yeah. Yeah. But like you said, I mean, by that, by part three, something is a franchise and you assume it's not now it's just about so, uh, some weird mass and, and kids are having bugs coming yeah. out of their eyeballs. Yeah. 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 Although, like, uh, like as a font nerd like me, they they did uh, maybe that was already jinxing it. They they used the font and, and, and in in the title sequence, right? And uh, uh, of Halloween three in the new Halloween. Yes. Uh, so and if uh, but that's, yeah, that's kind of really jinxing it. Like, if if you know that how much people hated the third part, why would you just like <laughs> deliberately invite? that into your film it's almost yeah. like planting a ghost into your own film mm -hmm. of, of 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 the nerdom nerdom hate from, from from 40 years ago yeah yeah so <laughs> what what um in growing up in austria could you see like all these american horror movies were they readily oh, sure, available yeah. oh yeah absolutely absolutely i mean there was almost all this stuff that i saw were uh american pop culture products Mm -hmm. Almost all of it. I mean, uh, there were, of course, interesting uh, European horror films or European uh, science fiction films as well, uh, as well. But most of the stuff came from the U.S. I mean, if the U.S. is good about something, then it's about storytelling and, and of just like uh, ex exporting that that kind of, of of storytelling. So, but I mean, really, like of all my favorite horror films, I mean. There's, it took a long time for for a European horror film to get into the top ten. I have to say, and and that's that's uh, uh, just like if 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 people probably many people know it already because it's also a classic in the meantime. But it's a uh, it's a Swedish film called uh, Let the Right One In. Oh yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm a big fan of. Uh... I weirdly I saw the remake first, so I saw the remake first. Ah, I liked it. Then the I remake saw the is not bad. Yeah, but the I remake is not I, bad. But of course, it's uh, but still the original is just like so yeah. beautiful. I think if just... I would have saw them in reverse order, I might have liked the remake less, just because it really is. They even do some of the same exact shots, which makes it kind of like less artistic to me. But it's it's still good. It's a good movie, and then oh, the yeah. book is great too. If you've ever read the novel. I've I've never read the novel. No, no, I haven't. I haven't. But I mean, there are so many, so many cool things, and yeah, and, and of course, some of the films, for example, uh, and you kind of also can see that in Masking Threshold. I'm a huge fan of uh, of this like weird in between horror films, like Phase Four, for example. Saul Bass made that film in 1974, and I think technically speaking, that's a British film. I don't even think that's a that that's an American production, but but. Uh, but I liked that a lot when I saw it uh, uh, as a kid the first time, and uh, and so of of all the European films that are 
kind of like horror related. Uh, most of them are kind of like, they have a documentary element to it. For example, Threads. I'm a huge fan of Threads, which is this TV production from Britain from 1984, which is a documentary. And at the same time, also a fictionalized account, fictionalized account of uh, nuclear war in Britain. So it's pretty much like it, it describes what happens in Britain when there is a Russian nuclear attack on the town of Sheffield in England. And so it is extremely horrifying. It has like some of the scenes I will never forget. I mean, there is this scene where this lady is standing like in the shopping district of, of Sheffield and the nuclear bomb explodes. And she just like pisses in her pants and you see the pee running out of her running out of her pants uh, uh, onto the ground. And this, this, like, this, this, th there are elements in there that just, like, are just, like, I cannot shake that away forever. Or, like, in the end, like, 15 years later, it goes, like, 15 years into the future, what happens to the, the generation after the generation that got blasted by nuclear radiation. And then you, and you never really see it, but you see, like, you, there, there is an implied, like, completely deformed baby uh that the daughter uh of 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 one of the main characters has and it's like incredible ah fuck but th that is horror th this is like straight up horror oh. <laughs> but it was not produced as a horror film it was produced as an educational piece of like hey nuclear war is not good you know like we cannot win any of this shit you know right. just don't do it you know yeah. so yeah, that's something that I some people argue online a lot, like over genre, and that's never that important to me. Like uh, some things, you know, it could be sci-fi, could be horror, could be drama. It's you know, I don't really understand the point of arguing yeah, over yeah. the genre. Or so something. How would you define horror? What is a horror film for you, or what is what is a horror aspect? Um, that's an interesting question because I, like you said, you mentioned seven, like I consider that a horror movie. Other people say it's a thriller. Um, I don't know something with, I guess there has to be a, either a villain or some type of monster, something, um, horrific, I guess. I don't know. It's, that's a weird question. It's more like if I watch something and if I know if it's horror or not to me, okay, okay. even, even like handmaid's tale, like yeah. I would consider that horror. I mean, it's yeah. horrific. I mean, there's a lot of debate about that. Like, is yeah. because Handmaid's Tale, many people say it's science fiction, but it's not science fiction. There is nothing science fiction y in that, right. in that film. In the same way that there is nothing science fiction y in something like uh, Children of Man, for example. For me, Children of Man is a horror film. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, but, but. I guess something that would uh, give you a sense of dread. Yeah, uh, not just yeah. not just a sense of like, oh, you're scared, but because uh, those things, uh, it's more realistic than a lot of horror movies I would watch. Handmaid's Tale. I read the book recently for the first time, yeah. and while I was reading it, it was right when Roe versus Wade was overturned, and like oh, I read this yeah. reading the book, well, I was listening to the audiobook, and, you know, and it's about the the doctors being hung on the wall who perform yeah. you know abortions, and I was like, you know, it's very even though it was written in the eighties, it was very topical yeah. today. And one of, one of the main influences was uh, the 1979 uh, uh, revolution, the, the Islamic revolution in, right. in Iran mm -hmm. was w one of the big things. But I mean, of course, I mean, any kind of uh, theocracy can go into that direction. I mean, this is like, just like that, that, that happens when, when people, people with a certain ideology get too much power and make their strange horrific like for them it's a paradise but for everyone else it's horror so mm -hmm. it's like it's also like an interesting yeah and it's interesting in the yeah. show because they go further from the from the moot from the book and it's not completely paradise for even the people who thought it would be which i think is an interesting concept yeah yeah and i mean i can see now because i already wrote uh read the the second book uh the testament mm -hmm. uh and which is plays a couple of, I don't know, like uh, years in the future after what's going on in The Handmaid's Tale. Mm -hmm. And I can already see what they are trying to do now in the fifth uh, season of Handmaid's Tale because they are they probably are planning uh, a series about the Testaments and they need to connect those timelines or they need to connect those worlds 
And it's kind of interesting to see what's going on now with Aunt Lydia and all that stuff, knowing what will be happening in the future in the Testaments. Yeah. So, so I'm looking for it. I hope they're making a series about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the, I had a conversation with friend Robin who uh, got me into reading the book about uh, aunt lady i think uh, the actress who plays her does a great job in this. oh yeah movie. absolutely yeah for example another one of my favorite films i've only watched it once i will maybe not watch it ever again but it's still one of my favorite films compliance from 2012 mm -hmm. and uh end out is also one of the main characters in, in, oh, I didn't in know that. that film okay and i mean i mean i mean this is just like if if you don't see this as a horror film I think your definition of of horror is too narrow minded. Right. <laughs> this is like what 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 can be more horrific? I mean, I mean, there are many many things, of course, that can be horrific. Right. But in that setting and how it is told and the dread and this like and you just like watch it and you kind of no don't no no just like I really I had a really really very horror film like point when I watched that film in the cinema. When I was almost started screaming at the screen and saying like, "Don't do it! No, don't, don't agree to this! Like, go away! Just walk out! Nobody stops you!" <laughs> and no, no, anyhow, yeah, but yeah, I've had the convert that debate all the lots of times online. People get uh, like, even if you like The Walking Dead or not, it doesn't matter. But uh, people have said it's not horror; it's post-apocalyptic drama survival this guy told me and i'm like you're just making up genres at this point yeah. i mean you could break down everything into like this really obscure genre if you're yeah, sure sure absolutely <laughs> and a, a friend of mine uh peter Hengel, he just recently released uh, not, not released but his he's he's still on festival tour with his film family dinner and uh it was interesting because I had a conversation with him, he when he was trying to figure out what his film is, and for me it was clear that this is a horror film. I mean, it's not as splattery or gory, but this is just like I mean, I'm not spoiling anything, but this is a horror film, yeah. And he said, "Yeah, but we don't know, and maybe it's a thriller horror or a horror thriller, or maybe it's really only a thriller." And Ah, I mean, the, the way we define it also defines to a certain degree the audience who will want to watch it. And maybe horror, the horror genre is too small. Maybe we want more people to see it than only horror fans. And so, I, and I, I was, I was watching him like we had a coffee and I was watching him like debate with himself. Uh, <laughs> right. What, what his film is. And for me, it was clear like, this is just a horror film. Just like, don't come on. You don't need to categorize it in a way. People will do that themselves. People right. will find the weirdest shit categories to put thing into. Yeah. Just, uh, just. I mean, first of all, it's a film. Uh, it's right. A film. Is it, do you like it or it's not? Is my main yeah, thing. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. But and like, uh, I always think like when you go in, when you used to go into the video store and the blockbuster, they didn't have eight thousand categories. Like, oh, here's the post-apocalyptic survival uh, zombie. Uh, drama film there, there you know it would be too many yeah. categories you know like yeah. i think that is one part of this element of like that people want to see the same thing again and again and again and again and it makes it just easier to find things oh i really watched i, I again like i i really liked whatever i don't know uh smile Mm -hmm. What other films are there like Smile? And then you might get up, end up like seeing It Follows or something like that. Right. I don't know. Uh, and I think that is, uh, I mean, that, that that's the problem of the algorithms and it's the problem of the, of the categories is that people are kind of getting trapped only being recommended the things that they like or only looking for the things that they like. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I think they're, they're missing out. What can I say? That's one of the things I like about festivals, though, because um, I see a lot of stuff that's, you know, weird and doesn't necessarily fit into one genre or fits into several genres. And there's also something about going into the movies as blind as possible, not knowing a lot about it. And uh, I think you can enjoy something more if you don't know too much about it. Yeah. 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 I'm so excited i mean of course it's kind of terrifying i mean it, it plays into the same fear or anxiety that that filmmakers of course have when a film gets released and then they are waiting 
do people like it? Do people get it? What mm. what what what's the reaction to the film? And then the the reviews are tickling in, like like uh, you know, like uh, on an IMDb. Or in the yeah. meantime, it's more more likely to be on Letterboxd because the the reviews on IMDb that's just like it's it's not what it used to be. And uh, and and then you see the reviews coming in, and I really I read them all because I really want to know and. Uh, and I, I I take a perverse pleasure out of reading all the reviews, even the bad ones, because I just it's it's the only way for me, besides of course having conversations with people that I know or meet in person, it's the only way of peeking into other people's brains and trying to see my film through their eyes. That's the only way of doing that. And of course it's completely impossible. I will never be able to see my film. Untainted by myself, of course, that's not possible. Yeah, that that's actually that could be an interesting uh, idea for a film. And an artist who wants to see his own work uh, as someone else would see it, and, and, and you know, something like that. How would he but, go about doing that? Trying to lose his own memory? I don't know how that you know, that would work out. He'd have to try to lose probably, his own he memory. Probably take or... some weird shit drug and and, and 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 wipe out his brain or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. Uh, but anyhow, but I mean that's 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 what I do all the time. Yeah. Weird, strange idea. Ah, the strange idea. Then at the end, the he just hates his own movie, which would uh, he's sitting there uh, writing yeah. down a bad review of his own film, not knowing that it was actually his. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's interesting to see that and read it, and and there 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 are so many great reviews of 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 Rot's Nest with really interesting thoughts and really interesting perspectives on something that I did. And there is most of the time nothing that super like that I have not read a review yet where someone came up with such a strange idea or such a strange way of reading or seeing my film. Uh that could also be fun of course if that happens. But but it's but it's interesting to see how how people react to and and most of the time what people put a focus on. For example, there is uh, there is one I think like German or Austrian uh, guy who wrote a really great review on Letterboxd of Rat's Nest, and he was pointing out a couple of things that nobody else was pointing out because it's stuff that you probably don't understand or don't see if you're not from Austria or Germany. For example, if you don't if you can't read German, there are some things in the film or some cultural contexts that are not, not really important to really be so, so you, you don't need to understand this to to be able to enjoy the film or, or or get the point but of course if you know that or if you have a little bit more context then it's just like a little bit more that you can get out of the film and he was for example he 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 uh he talks about there's this one there's this one scene in uh in rat's nest where let's call it like kind of like a sexual assault of kinds happens mm -hmm. and while that happens uh i put and that was of course very deliberately uh i i put uh i i filmed uh an lp cover and i saw it in one of the windows in that area where we shot uh, in one of the small towns that we shot uh, the rat's nest footage in and I was walking around in the town and I couldn't believe it that someone would have like a stack of LPs from the 70s and 80s sitting in there on their windowsill and the one LP cover that you could really read quite clearly because it was the, the front cover in the stack mm -hmm. and that is a song from the 1980s and it is uh, a song it's kind of like a novelty song almost everyone in Austria knows it and it's called Her mit meine Henna, which translates something like uh, bring on the chicks. And it's this like strange, like novelty song about where this one guy who definitely talks about women, but refers to them as chicks. And he's the rooster. I am the rooster. Bring on the chicks or something yeah. like that. So it's a completely bizarre rape culture song from the 1980s in Austria. Uh -huh. And I thought like, ah, fuck. And so I filmed that. And I put it into the film roughly around the same time the sexual assault happens in the audio commentary track. And, and of course, for people who can't read that or don't know what that LP is, 
it's just like some weird fragment, you know, and uh, uh, of visuals. And of course, if you know what that is, it gives you hopefully a couple goosebumps more. Uh, and it's a little. I actually, like, I uh, read this review. I think it's on the IMDb. Uh, that that review where where someone mentions that. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, that that's that's where I saw it. Yeah. And of course, I'm super happy then that something like that happens. That people really like take the time to not only watch the film, mm -hmm. but like sit down and make a statement about it, or try to explain something that other people probably have not seen there yet because they don't understand German or not Austrian or something like that. And and that gives me a lot of joy. And uh, and I, I'm I'm very similar, I guess, to you in that sense and also to like Michael Epstein and Sofia Cacciola because they also play a lot with that kind of stuff we, we all we all like our references and we all like that there are things in our films that people can discover mm -hmm. that are probably not that super important but there are st like this yeah. I don't know, like this like Easter eggs let's go right. it. and then it's Ultra always the, it's always the concern uh will you still like enjoy this if you don't get it because you can't have, you can't, uh, yeah. if it, if, I mean, I, I always like, if try you don't to, get it, I try to make it not relevant, movie, you know, yeah. 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 I think it's, it's almost like, uh, like, I mean, you can, you can, you can still enjoy a dinner, I would say, if you don't like the desserts and just skip the dessert. Sure, sure. So and I think there are, there are, there are elements to it that it doesn't, it doesn't diminish the dinner if you don't eat the dessert. You know, it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's what, what it is. Yeah. So, but, 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 but I get it. I mean, sometimes many people do films, especially if they are like nerdy genres, where the entire film is just like one reference anymore. And there's nothing beyond cultural references. And right. that's, of course, when it's, uh, so I, I like meta films. I, I like meta commentary. And of course, Rod's Nest is a meta commentary. But, but if there wouldn't be something inherently valid in that film that is beyond meta commentary, which is a story about war, and it's a story about, uh, like how humans are assholes in all kinds of different situations. Doesn't matter if you're like an asshole in the, in the 30 years war. Or if you're an asshole like uh, that's a director now from South Africa, I mean, there 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 are certain there, there are certain things in that film that 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 are important for me, and that's the basic message of the film. That's the basic uh, thing that I try to convey, and uh, and that of course has to work without understanding a single of the references. Of course, it's good to understand some of them, but it doesn't really matter. So it it has to be coherent and. And, and 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 a working story and, and and a working emotional machine let's call it even without any of the cultural references mm -hmm. yeah so uh, i saw you for the first time at uh, at nightmares in ohio and uh, you won you won an award which is very cool so uh, what did you actually do with your awards with your horses Oh, they are, uh, I, I made the joke when I got them uh -huh. that, that I would put them in my kitchen, right. uh, which actually more people would probably see it in my kitchen because all the people have to go through my, through my foyer, through the kitchen into my living room. So more people would see it in the kitchen, but no, they are on my windowsill. So I have like a little, little, uh, like corner of proudness and that's where the horses are sitting and, uh, the British Horror Film Festival award from last year, and some of that, and the the uh, Night of Horror gave me a, uh, an award for for screenwriting for for Masking Threshold last year, and they're all sitting there in the corner, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, next to my frog, uh, I have a relationship frog. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you want to get into that, but, but yeah, that that's 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 my that's my, I it it's it's a funny story. I like when I'm in the States, I like going to Barnes and Nobles because okay. it's kind of like strolling around Barnes the, and Nobles the today. Yeah. yeah. And they have a little section at Barnes and Nobles where they have children's toys. Mm -hmm. And they usually have like one of these, like it's almost, it looks like a tree and they have like hand puppets there. Mm -hmm. And they are from uh, a company in uh, California in the Bay area called Folkmanis, Folkmanis puppets. And they're really, really wonderful puppets. They have everything. They have spiders and lobsters. And I mean, there's, there's just like an, an enormous variety of, of extremely cool 
puppets, head puppets. They even have like three headed dragons. And it, it's just great. Like people should Google it. Folk Manis. I'm, I'm, I'm the biggest fan. And, uh, so Yasmin, my, my girlfriend shows up with this frog on her hand. It's just like, uh, what do you think about that? I cannot look away. This is just like the cutest thing we've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it? And I said, like, yeah, it's true. And I just like bought it. And now we have this like frog sitting in our corner right next to my awards. Mm -hmm. And and every Very now and then, when 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 she is angry at me or I'm angry at her, we get the frog and we say like, ah, uh, what you did to Yasmin yesterday, that was really not nice. I think you should talk about it. <laughs> so we have the relationship frog, <laughs> and 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 the weirdest thing is like, a couple of months later, we met a psychologist from from Austria who lives in the U.S. And she uses those puppets in her sessions as tools for her for her really? psychological sessions, her, psychi uh, her psychological yeah. treatment. And so we kind of discovered this on our own. And now we have a relationship frog, and everything is fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good. I like to relate. Does he have a Does he have a name besides a relationship? No, frog it's just frog. It's just no, no it's just like a frog. The frog, just or a frog. Okay. frog, or if we talk about him to other people, like with you, it's the relationship frog. But right. No, yeah. no, Mine's that's cool. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> nice. you mentioned the. Uh, but I guess, but that's the point. I think that's the point about. I mean, I guess my 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 girlfriend is is an artist and a curator, and I'm an artist. I mean, it is such a inherently human trait to tell stories. Storytelling is just like we, we are humans because we are storytellers, and we are storytellers because we're humans. There, there are probably only three things that are true about humans. We, we're a tool using species. We're a storytelling species and we're a sexual species. And the rest is probably speculation. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I would say that any kind of art is trying is a strange form of storytelling. If, even if you do abstract art, it is trying to convey a certain emotional story or, or it's, telling something and and that is true for most of the stuff that i'm doing and so the the relationship frog is just like a weird extension in my private life of like right. that storytelling is great and storytelling is something that that is really helpful and and therapeutic at times and uh, yeah great yeah w when did you know that's something you wanted to do like you wanted to tell stories you wanted to make movies honestly because you you, you said it before the first time i think i always had the the notion of like that I wanted to tell people about how I'm feeling and what I learned. So like when I was like, like a kid, they called me UFO Hannes, the UFO Johannes, uh, because I was totally into UFOs and I told everyone stories that I read about UFO sightings and stuff yeah. like that. And for me, it was almost like telling horror stories, you know, like this, this, the stories I thought that were true back then. I, totally believed in UFOs. And I was telling my friends, did you know that in 1978, this one woman disappeared in Ohio and blah, blah, blah. So it was almost like a, a way of like telling a, a ghost story yeah. that I thought was real. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so I always had this, this notion of when I saw a film or, or read something that I wanted to tell people about it. So that was the first time. It was also the same time I started telling jokes because jokes are also stories, like very precise and humorous, but, but little stories and that play with reality. And, uh, and I think, but then the really the moment that I really started thinking of like, this is something more, there's something more to that. Maybe you could really do something with that beyond just like entertaining your friends mm -hmm. is when I started playing role playing uh, role playing games, you know, like uh, Dungeons and Dragons, GURPS, yeah. that kind of stuff. I never really played Dungeons and Dragons. I was always a GURPS, like Steve, Stevie Jackson's uh, GURPS. I grew up with, uh, I grew up, uh, my brother's nine years older. So in the early 80s, I would play with, with him and his friends. He was the dungeon master, but I grew up playing D&D &D and yeah. all kinds of RPGs. Yeah. And I, I always enjoyed it the most when I could be the dungeon master, because you had to come up with a story. It would have to make sense mm -hmm. and you would have to tell it to your friends and they react to it and they can't be bored about the whole thing. So it is, uh, I think with playing, with starting to create uh, campaigns, I really kind of like 
started to think about like how do stories work analytically like how do they like they always have to like the, the three act structure you know like they have to have a beginning a middle and an end and why is that so and uh and i think in the beginning i just did it instinctively and at some point i just got interested in like how does that work? so and then you start reading about myths and storytelling and and uh, the hero's journey if you like it or not that's a different uh question but but playing with that and 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 lots of my my art projects and activist work and you know, they they're always telling stories in some way and uh yeah so so long before i started doing films i i wrote theater plays because it's just like cheaper and easier to to create a theater play uh because you don't need all the technology you just like need a couple of chairs where people can sit on and an empty corner and and you can you can create a theater play there and uh, of course that then in some way morphed into me more and more being interested in making films and and uh, first of course short films and and in the meantime i have to say i think uh, my my main output at the moment i'm doing very many things in, in other mm -hmm. formats as well but uh but but filmmaking kind of became very much like my my main focus in the last couple of years uh. um about the um documentaries because i think some people think that uh, to be a real documentary you don't like take a side but i don't really think that's true i think all, all, almost all uh successful documentaries do take us they have a side oh, yeah. that, they, yeah. that they're and they also but, i think through the editing are actually telling a story yeah, sure it's still a form yeah. of storytelling a absolutely i mean you always take a side there is no way of not taking a side i mean like the the moment when you're a documentarian and you chose what camera angle you use in what right. scene i mean just the, the way how you put like even if it's just about a talking head the way how you frame the talking head from what angle you shoot the talking head if you make the talking head especially beautiful or if you try to shoot it in a way that you see all the shadows and 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 the wrinkles and everything this is per default an aesthetical uh choice it's a content choice it's a political choice i mean i mean we we're we, the, the moment you buy a red bull at supermarket is a political decision uh and and people who are in in in, in recent years so many people are saying like well i am not political in my work and i'm not political in my art and i try to be as as neutral as possible most of the time it's bullshit most of the people who say stuff like that are right wingers because they want to they don't want to debate any of that you know like they say like i'm neutral i'm apolitical no you, you cannot be apolitical you have ideas about the world and that puts you in one or the other corner <laughs> it's like that's it you know Right. And and the same is true for documentarians. I mean there's like docu documentaries are cre are fiction too. They they have different rule sets and they have different ways of approaching something uh or or approaching the storytelling element of it but they are all fiction. There's 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 no art that is not fiction. <clears throat> yeah, like I like um for example uh um the uh, King of Kong a handful of quarters about uh the guys who play who and I think it's a great movie, but it's clearly edited where the one guy's the villain and one guy's the the good guy. And maybe that's true in yeah. real life. I don't yeah. know, but it's clearly made with that position that that go when you're watching it, one the one guy is the, is the yeah. underdog and the other guy's the villain. Yeah. And and someone made a choice to do that right and uh yeah i mean I'm, I'm working on a new documentary now and i mean in my documentaries i'm usually trying to avoid that conundrum because uh of like so this now is my like i'm working on my, my, my third documentary right now and it will be kind of like the next film that i that i created that will be out because it will be done i guess by february or something like that so so my my next film for the for the festival circus uh will will not be a horror film it will be a documentary although it's a very horrific uh topic it's about the american genocide and 
the Native American population and, and COVID and stuff like that. So they, it's also very horrifying, but it's, it's not a horror film. And, uh, and so it's my third film. And that is a documentary film, my third documentary. And I'm always placing myself in the documentary as a strange form of myself as a kind of moderator or host of some kind. It's not always like the closest to my true self is the one in uh, Trace Route because it's about my story as a nerd and I'm traveling around and meeting people that I like that are nerds and introducing them and introducing people to concepts that are nerdy. So that is closest, of course, to, to what I really am. But, uh, but in Glossy of Broken Dreams, for example, it's a very political documentary and it's about explaining concepts. So because so many people online debate about capitalism and resistance and privacy and all that stuff. And I wanted to make a documentary that's almost like a Sesame Street kind of way of like explaining political terms to people. So what does capitalism really mean? Uh, what does resistance mean? What is privacy? What is et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, I'm in that documentary as the person who keeps it all together. And of course, it's my personal political view. I, I'm, 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 I'm not avoiding uh, saying like, this is my film. This is my perspective on the world. And here you have it and you can take it or not. That's, that's, that's whatever, whatever you decide. But of course, many people complain about that. Whoa, this is just a propaganda movie, blah, 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 blah. Well, I'm saying from the very beginning, this, this film is a perspective on the world and it's my perspective. Uh, so you might see that as propaganda or not, but if you're making a film, it's always your perspective. Mm -hmm. And of course, if it's something that's very political, people who have a different political view like like to label it as propaganda or or uh, well, something else or, or or dismiss it but i mean honestly i have to say i like watching uh right-wing documentaries and there are a lot of them coming out right now for example the one about uh what was it what is a woman just came out mm. i think like half a year year ago or something like that and it's a very straightforward right-wing perspective, essentialism, uh, like anti-trends and, and, and all that stuff. It's but it's interesting for me to see that in a certain yeah. way. I'll just say it's interesting yeah, because, because I, I, don't, mean, I don't like to post this on Facebook because people will get the wrong idea. But I watch a lot of right-wing, like uh, um, not news so much, but like the talking people. Like I actually watch some Gavin McGinnis stuff because I like just to see what those people actually talk about because I don't want to yeah, just exactly. go off what, what people say they say. I think it's better yeah. to actually And how know. are they framing it? What's, what's, what's their, what's their storytelling approach to the world? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, for, for people who are left wingers, like, like, like me, uh, I want to understand how that works. How does their propaganda work? How does right. their world building? Yeah. I'm a very, I mean, I grew up on the Cape. Approach? I'm a very liberal guy, but it's interesting to me exactly what, what do these other people think? Sometimes it's very scary stuff. Like I, there is a rise of people who really believe in demons and like, in Satan worship, like, and not just like what well, you think, maybe some like someone in the hills or something. It's like more mainstream yeah. people that you would think would be like beyond thinking that there's actually yeah. people who worship have these secret cults and and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And and it, it's interesting to see that because uh, because in the 1980s, for example, the conservatives were always the anti-demonic force, at least that's what they presented themselves. They had, they were demonizing dungeons and dragons and right. stuff like that and, and metal music and all that stuff, because that's all devil worshiping and Satanism and stuff like that. And it's interesting that over the last 30, 40 years, uh, how conservatism works changed and, and the, the, the narration and the storytelling changed. And now you have very straightforward, conservative people kind of like embracing that and uh and and you suddenly have people who are conservatives who actively say like we 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 embrace this we want to change the world by 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 uh but doing things that that i mean i, I don't want to get ah, jesus christ uh anyhow <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's uh it's are you there? And then there there are times like um wow. some of them I'll watch, some of them I just don't even understand why people would watch. There's people like Alex Jones who when I was younger, I honestly would have enjoyed watching him, but not taking it seriously, watching it because it's he he is very funny. But the but the the idea that people actually take him serious and want to follow him that's what makes him dangerous to me. But um, I do find it interesting to watch all these people just to see exactly what they are saying. Yeah, yeah. I I hope I'm uh I'm I'm back on because I think I had a slow internet connection. It uh -huh. was actually pretty scary. Uh, the, the moment the moment that we started talking about Satanism and stuff like that, you started to glitch up and you're uh -oh. like, go 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 <laughs> and I thought like, oh man, no. yeah. Satan does not like us to talk about that. So yeah. he he's yeah. interfering with the internet connection when we start talking about Satan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I uh, people talk about satanic panic, but I think it's actually kind of on the rise again. The people that that are uh, really worried about these things. Yeah, yeah, and of course, I mean, it's always easy to to demonize your political opponent opponent in a way that is so bad i mean you're like the whole stuff about pizza gate and mm -hmm. eating babies and drinking their blood in the basement and stuff like that and, and you would think so only like someone just, on stuff you would think only I mean, just <laughs> this really fringe people would think that but it's it's almost mainstream that people <laughs> people actually there's a lot of people who really believe in these things yeah absolutely can you still hear me? There was like lots of glitchy, glitchy, glitch. Yeah, I hear you, on. but I, I think I think I'm freezing up for you. Oh, okay. Yeah, but we can wrap Anyhow, it up, and we well, can do a part two I at mean, another time because uh, yeah, I know you I, have to go a, pretty soon. But whatever, whatever I think, I at some point I have to get, I, I have to 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 clean the ectoplasm out of my bathroom here, and uh, probably have to get my ass outside into the wonderful spring-like weather of north carolina for a cucaloris festival because the weather is really nice outside nice. i'm happy that i'm not in austria now but in north carolina all right very good well it's been a pleasure to talk with you again i had a great time meeting you and uh we will do another one of these down the road sure absolutely uh like it's always a pleasure uh, chatting with you, I'm, I'm very happy that I could surprise you in uh, in Ohio with my surgeon outfit. I was very, very <laughs> pleased. So I have uh, I have my umbilicus desidero trophies up here, which uh, you, you are part oh, of. Oh, yeah. there they are. All two but you don't them. have a relationship frog. The relationship frog is missing. So yeah, yeah. I have a relationship gnome. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. This. Uh, this is quite something. Gnomes, gnomes, <laughs> it is gnomes. quite something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wonderful. All right. So, yeah. excellent. We'll, we'll do this again sometime. It's honestly, it's, very, it's always fun to talk with you. Oh, I, I, absolutely. There is this old German punk saying from the 1980s: "The good forces cannot be kept apart." And I have the feeling of like uh, we will not be able to. Uh, to to keep ourselves apart. <laughs> I like this. Yeah. And uh, how where can people follow you? Not in in North Carolina or Austria, but online to see see what you're up to. Oh, like with my strangely long and stupid name, uh, I'm the only person with that name right. uh, on the internet. Uh, so people that just like if 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 you just Google my last name, uh, you'll find me on Twitter. You'll find me on Facebook, on Instagram uh tell like telegram whatever everywhere so i'm i'm easily to find right. and if people want to like that like the easiest way to catch me is send me an email i'm kind of like a 90s person about that so i uh, send email me email. a lot too yeah all right very good we'll talk hey. to you. enjoy Absolutely. Uh, have a wonderful ha have a wonderful time in your corner of the u.s you as well and, enjoy the uh, festival and and enjoy being a stuffing all right. I will indeed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>